This meeting is being recorded. All right, everyone, it's seven o'clock, so I'm going to start with my introductions and folks can kind of pop in as they're able to join. Um, welcome, everyone. Thank you all so much for tuning into the ups and downs of Skinny Atlas Lake. My name is Camille Marcotte, and I'm the water and ecology educator with Cornell Cooperative Extension Onondaga County, working as part of the Skinny Atlas Lake Education Program, which is funded by the City of Syracuse to provide education to help protect the water quality in Skinny Atlas Lake. I just want to share our next event and go over some quick logistical items, and then I'll turn it over to Bill. Um, this is our second program of 2023, but we are working hard to plan additional programs for this year related to Skinny Atlas Lake. Our next program will be the first of about four programs in a collaborative um, series on shorelines with Skinny Atlas Lake Association and Go Native Perennials and some other partners. We're kind of still working on all the logistics of the series, but the first session is scheduled and it will be all about shoreline ecosystems why they are important and how humans impact them. That session is scheduled for April 6th at 7 p.m. on Zoom. So please stay tuned for more details and registration information on that program. I'll be talking to the speaker tomorrow, so, so I should have details for you very soon. We are currently using Zoom in webinar mode, so you all are muted to reduce any background noise because there's quite a few of you. If at the end you'd like to ask a question using the mic or audio, you can use the raise hand button at the bottom of your screen and I can unmute you. We will wait until the end to answer any questions, but feel free to type questions throughout the webinar into the chat and Q&A sections. It's better if you use the Q&A section, but I know sometimes people can't find it if they're on their phone or a tablet. If you use the Q&A function, you can also ask questions anonymously if that's more comfortable for you, and I will monitor both of those for when we get to the question and answer portion. This program is being recorded and it will be available to watch on our YouTube channel. The link to that video will be shared in a follow-up email along with an evaluation and any other resources. I will post a link to the general program evaluation in the chat. Please take a few minutes to fill that out after the program. If you run into any technical issues throughout, please either email me, I'll put my email in the chat or message me in the chat and I will do my best to respond and help you troubleshoot. So I'm going to introduce our speaker now, Bill Capel. Bill earned both undergraduate and graduate degrees from Penn State. He has worked as a hydrologist for the U.S. Forest Service in Missouri and Wisconsin for about 45 years. He has studied the hydrogeology of upstate New York with the U.S. Geological Survey, New York State Water Science Center. At present, he is a hydrogeologist emeritus, which is a fancy word for a volunteer, with the New York Water Science Center. And right now in his emeritus status, he is assisting various projects in central and western New York in the collection and analysis of data. So I will turn it over to you, Bill, and I will share your PowerPoint. All right. Okay, good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm having a little bit of problem sharing, so uh, Camille is going to be doing it. You're gonna hear a lot of me saying next, so uh, please bear with us on that. Okay, next. <laughs> Basically, the ups and downs of Skinny Atlas Lake or how I learned to stop worrying and accept the changes in Skinny Atlas Lake water level. This should sound familiar. It comes from Dr. Strangelove with apologies. And uh, basically the uh, presentation is mine and Camille has helped with a lot of uh, gathering of background information. Next. This is the uh, uh, Oswego River Basin of which Skinny Atlas Lake is part of. Uh, it's about 5,200 square miles. It's slightly larger than the state of Connecticut but all of the lakes you see highlighted in white and the blue lines is all part of the Seneca River, which joins the Oneida River and then drains down through the Oswego River to Lake Ontario. Next. Skinny Atlas Lake is that area uh, surrounded by, uh, you wanna go back one, Camille, please, is basically part of this watershed and it drains north, entering uh, the uh, Seneca River near Jordan. Okay, next. 
This is a rather crude description of the topography of the area. The Appalachian Plateau is basically the 1,000 and 2,000 foot contours. You'll notice that many of the Finger Lakes, if not all, are basically uh, gouged by glacial activity into the Appalachian Plateau. And prior to the formation of the Mohawk River, which goes off to the, goes off to the east through Oneida Lake, uh, the Tug Hill Plateau was actually part of uh, the Appalachian Plateau. Next. And again, the area surrounded by the dotted line is Skinny Atlas Lake. You'll notice that the thousand foot contour is very tight to Skinny Atlas Lake. And this comes into play in the, our future discussion. Next, please. All right, this is from a publication I put together, oh, back in the 1990s. It is somewhat of a cartoon. If you'll notice across the bottom of the screen, the tick marks are representative of a distance of 10 miles for each tick mark. But you'll notice on the left side of the screen, the vertical, each tick mark is representative of 25 feet. So it's not nowhere close to scale. Also, the finger legs that are shown those are not the depths of the finger legs. Uh, they're meant to show the surface water elevation of the finger legs, starting from Canandaigua Lake, then moving to Cuca Lake, which drains to Seneca Lake, which drains to Cayuga Lake. And then you go to Owasco, Skinny Atlas, and then to Otisco. You'll notice that most of the, most of the finger legs drain to a section of the Erie Canal or the New York State Barge Canal that starts near Montezuma and goes over to Baldwinsville. This is about a 30 mile stretch where the water surface elevation is flat. Interestingly enough, prior to the, uh, the creation of the Barge Canal in the 1920s, the original Erie Canal was off line of the rivers, but the river itself was still very flat. Next, please. Okay, next. Okay, this is the watershed for Skinny Atlas Lake. This is provided by the City of Syracuse Water Department. You see the outline of the lake. It's pretty narrow in comparison to uh, the other Finger Lakes. In the southern end of the, of the Skinny Atlas Lake Valley, the slopes are very steep. As we go through the presentation, I intersperse with pictures from the Skinny Atlas Historical Association. And some of those pictures you'll get to see if you've never been down to this other than the lake, how steep the slopes are. Okay, next. The upland watershed area is about 59 square miles. Next. The lake surface area is about 13 and a half square miles. Next. The total area is about 72 square miles. Next. So the watershed to lake ratio is 4.3 to one, basically saying that for every 4.3 acres of the watershed, that's uh, basically matched to one acre of the, of the lake. This too is very important in understanding the ups and downs of Skinny Atlas Lake. Next. This is a view at the head or the southern end of the lake. It's on the east side. And you can see the hillside to the right. And uh, basically, it's very steep. And this is one of the reasons why water can move very readily from the upper parts of the watershed down to the lake. Next. Again, another map of the watershed. This one shows the land use within the watershed. About 40% of it is forest. And a lot of that forest is in the southern end. And you note that it's very green along the southern end of the lake because of the steep slopes. About 50% is agriculture. It's not all cows, it's orchards, it's vineyards, uh, cropped areas for the cows. And it consists basically in the uplands. And as you get further to the north, you'll notice that the, uh, the uh, agricultural areas do start approaching the lake because the elevation is much less steep. And so it's more easily accessible for farming. Next. This is a view from Glenhaven, east side of the lake, looking toward Fairhaven on the west side. 
again, you can see the steepness of the slopes. M much of it is forested. There were areas that were farmed on these very steep slopes. Next. Okay, where does the water from Skinnyatis Lake come from? One source, precipitation. Next. Where does the water from Skinny Atlas Lake go? Multiple answers to this one. There's a controlled discharge at the north end of the lake in the village, and that's where Skinny Atlas Creek begins. These water discharges are, are controlled for one high water discharge. There is a limitation on the amount of water that can be released from the lake to Skinny Atlas Creek. This is because it, it prevents downstream flooding and also erosion along the creek itself. Next. And the releases are also tempered by downstream water level and flow in the Seneca River. To be good neighbors, you have to be cognizant of what's going on uh, upstream as well as downstream. During low water discharge, it is limited to not less than 6 million gallons a day. This is to protect the flora and the fauna in the creek. And also there's wastewater assimilation. This, the village of Skinny Atlas has their wastewater treatment plant downstream. And that the discharge that is required to be in Skinny Atlas Creek helps to assimilate the, the clean water or cleaner water discharge from the wastewater treatment plant. Next. And finally, the biggest use of water on a continuous basis is that it supplies water to the city of Syracuse and the villages of Skinny Atlas, Jordan, Elbridge, and also to residents who live along the lake and get their water from the lake proper. Next. Okay, this is a picture of the creek just downstream from Skinny Atlas itself. There was enough water and enough change in slope and enough dams put across the creek that there was a tremendous amount of industrial development along the creek which used water power. Uh, the one case here is the Hoyts Dam and there's a grist mill that was to the right. And there were a number of different industries that utilized the water that was leaving the lake. Next. This is called the rule curves each Finger Lake has a set of these. Basically, these are targets for water levels in the lake at different times of the year. The upper bar is the high water level and the lower is the low water level. Not much of a change, maybe about you know a foot difference depending on the time of the year. This is the target elevations that the uh, control structure and the city of Syracuse utilizes to try to shoot at. It looks very simple on this graphic, but very difficult to work with mother nature. Next. Again, this is a picture of Glenhaven. It was a, uh, uh, an area that was utilized uh, for water cures. Uh, you can see in the background, the high elevation of the, the hillside behind it, but look in the foreground at the lake. The lake level is down considerably uh, in the far, uh, left hand side of the picture, there was a wetland and that wetland at this time of the year was dry. Again, indicating that the water level does fluctuate naturally. Next. Okay, this is called a spaghetti diagram and you can see why. Uh, these are selected water levels, basically decadal water levels. Uh, you can see on the graphic on the right, it's 1951, 61, 71 and so on. There are some uh, extremes as far as upper and lower water level elevations. Next. This uh, dotted line box is that basically the area within what is called the rule curves for the lake. And you can see for the most part, most of the time, the, you know, the rule curves seemingly work, but there are excursions such as the 1972 hurricane, Hurricane Agnes, which really shot up the water level. And then during 1988, it was a drought and the water level was quite low. There are limitations on how this water level is con can be controlled and we'll get into that in a little bit. Next. A view from Hemlock Island. You can notice in this picture that the water level is rather high. Number one, there's a boat that's turned upside down. And number two, if you look at the dock, 
it's obvious that part of the dock is underwater. So again, water level fluctuations are not unusual in this lake. Next, please. All right, this is a view from roughly 1825. The blue line is representative of the Erie Barge Canal that was constructed in the early 1800s, about 1818 18, 18 to about 1820. It is not in the river proper itself. Next, uh, Camille slowly stepped through. Lyons to the west, and then Clyde, and then Montezuma. Jordan, this is where uh, Skinny Atlas Lake drains into the Barge Canal. Now, this is very critical. Skinny Atlas Lake and the water leaving Skinny Atlas Lake drain down to Jordan, and Jordan is a summit elevation along the old Erie Barge Canal. This means that water that was going to be used for lockages to the west came from Skinny Atlas Lake and allowed boats to move down toward Montezuma. Also, from Jordan, as you went east and toward Syracuse, if you're going to do that, you needed water from Skinny Atlas Lake to step down from the summit at Jordan down to Syracuse. Okay, one more time. This is Baldwinsville. Baldwinsville is on the Seneca River. There's going to be a couple of quotes in, the, in uh, future slides, and we'll be talking about basically the river level between the Montezuma area and Baldwinsville and where the present New York State Barge Canal is located back in the 1920s. They basically took and the Erie Canal and put it in the river system versus in the old Erie Canal prism because the this rivers could be widened and deepened much more easily and take much larger barge traffic. Okay, next please. Okay, this is called a digital elevation model. It's a computer generated model of uh, the topography and the lakes. Uh, all those funny looking hills all sort of aligned are called drumlins. Uh, those were created by glaciation, but they also tell you the direction of ice flow. And you'll notice it very much coincides with the Finger Lakes. At Skinny Atlas Lake, you can see the movement of water moving to the north, going through uh, Skinny Atlas Falls area, and then getting down closer to Jordan and then entering the uh, Seneca River. The Barge Canal, the old Erie Canal, was located not in this area, and unfortunately I can't show it to you here, but basically it was in the area south of the Seneca River and moving over towards Syracuse. Next, please. Okay, the following is a series of information that I got from reports from the State Senate and State Assembly to uh, basically uh, the construction and continual construction of the Erie Canal, which during the 1850s was widened and deepened because the canal was so successful in barge canal traffic moving west to east and east to west. Okay, next. The first is uh, 1852, the fall of the Seneca River. This is the Seneca River from Rochester Railroad Bridge, basically in the northern part of Cuga Lake to Baldwinsville, it was only 12 and a half feet, which over a distance of over 30 miles is about a half a foot per mile. In other words, it's flat. Next. Okay, the 1853 report. Basically, the lowering of the Seneca River at the foot of Cuga Lake is proposed as the river level at Jack's Reef is to be lowered by three feet. Bars, sandbars, not drinking, uh, were removed at the foot of Cuga Lake, Martins Rapids, and the Mosquito Point. This is a recurring, uh, basically, notation that you'll hear throughout this, uh, these uh, little snippets that I'm showing here. The idea of draining Cuga marshes was basically in hopes of drying it up so it could be farmed. Also, when they put in the Erie Canal, many of the workers were, you know, were suffering from swamp fever and things like that, basically mosquitoes. And so they wanted to drain the canal, but in order, uh, excuse me, to drain the, the, uh, the, the wetlands at Montezuma. And to do so, they had to try to lower the Seneca River 
which was not easy. Next. Many adjustments made in the 1830s to the present to further lower the water level at Montezuma to this point have been ineffectual. You have to remember back there, everything was being done by hand. There weren't dredges, there weren't steam shovels, there wasn't dynamite. So everything had to be done by hand and it took an inordinate amount of time and very rarely were they successful. Next. This 1850, 55 observation is key. I'm going to read it. As the country is cleared up and the swamp lands drained and subjected to cultivation, the time required for heavy rains to find their way to stream and lake is much shortened. Is this beginning to sound familiar? When in former time the lowlands held back and distributed slowly their contents for weeks, a few hours now suffice to precipitate the falling waters into their natural avenues of escape. Something must be done to prevent this flooding. This is 170 years ago, and this is the refrain that we still hear today. Next. Okay, 1860, report of the commissioners relative to the draining of the Cuga marches. Blockages downward from Buffalo to Montezuma, again, the Cayuga Lake at Seneca River was the low point of the Barge Canal. And from Jordan, the, the summit level back to Montezuma create additional flows to the Seneca River. That water from Jordan to Montezuma was water from Skinny Atlas Lake. Next. 1860, cut in the area of Jack's Reef, completed in 1857. Jack's Reef, and you'll see references to reefs. Those reefs are actually bedrock highs that naturally existed in the river, the Seneca River. And because they were natural, and again, they didn't have dynamite back then, they found it very difficult to remove those bedrock highs. The reason uh, they got what they did by making this cut was they basically cut off a meander. And what they did was in this section, they physically mined or quarried out the area between one side of the meander and then the other, and then finally removed the uh, makeshift dams to basically cut off Jack's Reef because they couldn't get to Jack's Reef. When they did that, they lowered Cross Lake by about four feet. Sandbars removed at Hickory Point, Mosquito Point, Railroad Show. Basically, they we're still working on these and will continue to enlarge these cuts in other shoals, fans, and reefs. They were still trying to lower the Seneca River and finding it extremely difficult to do so. Next. 1865. These observations, roughly 1875 to 1883, indicate improvements made have reduced low water stage at Cuga Lake by one foot. Not much. At the Richmond Aqueduct, basically within the Montezuma Marsh by two feet, and Mosquito Point by four, basically this was the result of the uh, cut made at Jack's Reef. Next. In the early 1900s, about 1920-ish, the Erie Canal was modified by placing the canal into and modifying the natural river courses. Basically the uh, Canandaigua, the Clyde, the Seneca River, and even going downstream, the, uh, the Seneca River joining the Oneida River at uh, the discharge from Oneida Lake, and even the Oswego River further downstream. And basically leaving the alignment of the old Erie Canal. Next. Okay, water level management is to assure as best as possible the continuing water supply for the villages of Skinny Atlas, Jordan Elbridge, and the city of Syracuse. Next. The regulation of water level of the lake is adjusted for periods of precipitation or the lack of it and is limited by how much water can be released. We had those numbers earlier based on the stage of the lake and the amount of water that can be discharged to the creek during high and low flow. Next, during extreme precipitation and runoff events, 
one inch of water falling on the watershed can add nearly five inches of water to the lake level. And this can be done in a, less than a, a day's time. The water level can rise very quickly due to that much rain coming off the watershed. If it was two inches of rain, it, you're talking almost a foot rise in maybe a day or so. And if there's more rain, even more so. Okay, next. During the high lake stages, only a prescribed amount can be released from the lake. Therefore, you can only change the lake level by a few tenths of a foot on a daily basis, depending upon what Skinny Atlas Creek can take and what is going on downstream in the Seneca River. Again, good neighbor policy. Next. During low, 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 low water periods, obviously during droughts, the water level will be low, but due to the requirements to have a base flow in the creek, the lake's level will slowly fall to meet this requirement of discharge to Skinny Atlas Creek during low water conditions. Next. At the same time, the villages in the city require a steady supply of water. But if the water level conditions are, are at low level criteria, the water supply to the village in the city will be maintained as best as possible, but next, it can be supplemented. Basically water to the city of Syracuse can be supplemented from water from Lake Ontario. Onondaga County Metropol Metropolitan Water Board has a pipeline connection to Lake Ontario, which uh, helps supply water to the city of Syracuse and probably in the future to Micron and other large business other large companies that are coming into the Syracuse area. But for the most part, Skinny Atlas Lake is the primary supply. Interestingly enough, back in the late 1800s, the city of Syracuse was growing and they, they realized that they needed a water supply. They looked at Oneida Lake, they looked at Atisco Lake, they looked at Skinny Atlas Lake, they looked at the Tully Lakes at the south end of the Onondaga Creek Valley. They looked at drilling wells. They looked at multiple places, but Skinny Atlas Lake was the most important and most reliable system that they could uh, utilize. Again, realize that while the Erie Canal, the old Erie Canal was functioning, it was also supplying water to the Erie Canal. So timing wise, it was a, a tough, Time, time period between about 1890 to about 1920 because water was being supplied to, to the villages and to the city and also being supplied to the Barge Canal or the Erie Canal. Next. Okay, this is the outlet of Skin Atlas Lake. This is the condition that everybody wants to see. There's water, not too much, not too little. This is the ideal condition. Next. Okay, during October and November of 2021, there was a large storm that affected the Finger Lakes region. We're gonna go through and basically we're going to uh, look at newspaper reports for each one of the lakes, starting at the west, Canandaigua Lake, seen its water level rise almost to official flood level, other Finger Lakes, Honey Oil and, uh, that's not supposed to be a Wasco, uh, were basically not severely affected. Basically saying that from Canandaigua Lake West, the rainfall was not as, ter as terrific as it was at Canandaigua and further to the east. Next, Cuca Lake. Heavy rains over the last week caused water levels in several of the Finger Lakes to rise more than a foot in a matter of hours. Again, very much similar to Skinny Atlas Lake. Uh, causing all types of problems. Next, Seneca Lake. Last week's rains and extra, extraordinary flow from Cuca Outlet. Cuca Outlet drains to the lake. This is where we have to talk about good neighbor policy. Were they discharging too much water from Cuca Lake to Seneca Lake? Uh, that's, up, up, that's up to uh, them to figure out. I'm not going to make a judgment on that, but basically Seneca Lake water level rose from 460, 446 to four, almost 448, almost two weeks in, in two feet in a week's period. 
is expected to remain an inch or two below official flood stage for at least until Thursday evening. In other words, there was a possibility and the water level did continue to rise in Seneca Lake. Next, Cayuga Lake. Again, remember, Cayuga Lake gets its water not only from its watershed, but from Cayuga Lake and Seneca Lake. Cayuga Lake at Ithaca rose more than a foot and a half in 16 hours after heavy rains on Tuesday. At 7 a.m. that morning, the lake level stood at 382 and a half. By evening, it swelled to 384, a foot and a half rise, easily passing flood stage. This morning, the 27th, Cuga Lake was reported at 384.8, barely below 385, which is the official flood level. You're starting to get the feeling that, okay, from Cuca to Seneca to Cuyuga, they got the bulk of this precipitation. And that bulk of precipitation varied from two to three and a half inches for the entire storm. Next, Skinny Atlas Lake. Due to the heavy rains and flooding in recent days, lake levels have exceeded the mean high water elevation for the lake. In other words, it went above the rule curve and it went above pretty drastically and water levels were likely to be elevated for several weeks. They could only release so much a day. And finally, next, Cross Lake. These are, Cross Lake is basically part of the Seneca River. Residents were furious that the management of the regional water flows had allowed Cross Lake and the Seneca River to rise to an elevation of 383, roughly nine feet above its normal level. The Seneca River and Cross Lake are in a very tough position. Rather than having a lake, a large lake, even a small lake that could accept water or even wetlands around it, the Seneca River and Cross Lake are basically in a trough. And all that water that was coming from upstream and was being regulated to be released as slowly as possible, but to relieve flooding upstream, Basically, all that water went into a trough. And because it went into a trough, the only way the water level could go was up. Even with the dam that is at Baldwinsville, which by the way, is sitting on a reef, a bedrock high at Baldwinsville, even with that and with gates that they opened up to try to allow water to flow more quickly downstream in the Seneca River, their water level did rise this nine feet and it stayed up there for a long period of time. Again, this is part of this good, good neighbor policy where you've got to think not only of what's going on where you are, but what's going on downstream. Next. Okay, I have this statement. I've used this in all of my presentations to uh, residents who live along lakes, who live along streams. And basically it is uh, from the Odyssey and it talks about Olympus, where they say the God's eternal mansion stands unmoved, never rocked by gale winds, never drenched by rains, nor do the drifting snows assail it. No, the clean air stretches away without a cloud and a great radiance plays across that world where the blithe gods live all their days in bliss. This quote is what we all look for, whether we live on a river, whether we live on a lake, whether we live in the woods, whether we live on a farm, we want things to be steady. We don't like to see change. We don't like to see too much of anything. We don't want to see too much of anything. Next. Unfortunately, there is no Olympus within the Oswego River Basin. So we are at the mercy of our highly and becoming more highly variable climate. In other words, gale winds, drenching rains, drifting snows, these things change water levels in rivers and change water levels in lakes. Next. While we can enjoy clean air and water if we do things right, all of our days are not lived in bliss. We are at the, uh, the druthers of mother nature. Next. With emphasis, mother nature rules. We have to keep up with these changing rules because our climate is changing. We have to understand these changes and we have to act accordingly. We have to understand that we have limited control on our lakes, on our rivers. And we have to understand that 
then we have to understand how, what we can do to try to limp to not eliminate but limit damages that do occur. Next. Okay, the Mottville Dam. At this point, I just want to uh, tell a story. Uh, I gave a presentation years ago along Cayuga Lake, and uh, I live not near the I near live near the lake, but not on the lake. And I was walking through the village that I live in, and this lady approached me and said, uh, "Mr. Capel, I need you to help me." And I said, "What do you need?" And she said, we just brought some, bought some property on the lake and we want you to tell us what we should do so we can build our house so we won't be affected by flooding. And I said, well, that's different. And I said, sure, I'll be happy to help you. So she drove down to the lake. We walked past these houses that already existed on the lake, walked into a ravine where a stream was flowing down. And she said, here we are. And I looked around and to the north, there was a ridge. To the south, there was a ridge and flowing in the middle of it was a stream. Now the stream came down through the middle of that gorge, but then it went to the south side of the gorge. And she said, well, we wanna build here. And I'm going, oh no, but you know, I had to be positive about this. So I said to her, have you ever seen houses along uh, the ocean where they, they're on pilings. And she said, yes, and it's so ugly. And I said, those houses are on pilings for a reason because they're along the ocean. If a hurricane comes in, they get tremendous winds. The water level rises in the ocean and a lot of the houses are being flooded. So a lot of the, the, uh, the way that things can be done is to raise the houses up. So the living quarters are not affected. Oh, that, that's, that's terrible. We, we, we can't do anything like that. And I said, that's my advice. I advise that you speak to your husband about this and then you make your decision. And so that's the last I heard of it. A couple of years later, there was a major flood on Cayuga Lake. And you know I had forgotten about this incident, but one day I was walking down the street and this lady who I didn't recognize ran up and gave me this big hug. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. And it's like, okay, why? Well, you know, I, do you remember me? We, we went down and, and the house, you know, it was by the, by the creek and everything else. And I said, oh yeah, I remember that. Well, my husband has relatives that live along the ocean. And they said that was the smart thing to do. So that's what these people did was they put their house up on stilts. They basically put some, you know, plywood on the stilts and they stored their small sailboat, the kids' bikes and other stuff in there. She said, you were right. When that storm occurred, that water came down that gorge and it went straight and it ripped out the plywood. It, it basically put our sailboat in the middle of the lake and Lord knows where the bicycles are. And she said, thank you. So again, there's these things that can be done but it's expensive. I have relatives that live on Long Island. When Hurricane Sandy came in, cities along the South shore of uh, Long Island were flooded out. Water basically came right out of the ocean, was blown inland. If you go to Long Beach, Long Island, that's where near where my relatives live, you will see houses that are built on stilts or are built on a foundation to raise the house up. You will see other houses that are abandoned. There are people who couldn't afford it and basically left their house. There are other people with probably some help raised their houses up so that they could live in them. This is the things that I'm talking about. We don't live in Olympus, but there are things that we can do. Maybe not as extreme as putting your house on stilts, but there are things that we can do. There's only so much that can be done to control water levels. And we have to realize that we have to take personal responsibility as well as trying to have those responsible for water levels to try to manage them as best as they can. Okay, I'll get off my pulpit now, next slide. 
Okay, the takeaways from this uh, presentation. One, skin mass lake is a, is a small watershed and a small lake in comparison to Cayuga and Seneca Lake. Next. The lake supplies water to the villages of Skinyas, Jordan, Elbridge, and the city of Syracuse. This is not unusual. All the other Finger Lakes are also used for water supply. City of Ithaca not only gets its water from uh, a stream, but it also gets some of its water supply from Cuyahoga Lake. There are other municipalities along the lake and other municipalities along other lakes, as well as the residents who live along the lakes themselves. Next. The watershed to lake ratio is 4.3 to 1. Therefore, one inch of precipitation and runoff can add you know, about five inches of water level, two inches, three inches, snow melt, snow melt runoff. You will see that water level rise very quickly. Next. Under ideal conditions, discharge from the lake to Skinny Alice Creek can only reduce the level by maybe a few tenths of a foot over the course of a day, depending upon what's going on in the creek and what's going on down in the Seneca River. Next. What was said 170 years ago, as far as routing water too quickly to a stream or to a lake is true today, if not even more so. Uh, you know, the, the municipalities, the farmers, you know, basically tile their fields. They need to get in the fields, understood. When they tile the fields, the municipalities come in and they, they dig the ditches deeper and they continually dig them. All of this is routing water more quickly down these slopes to the lakes. And this causes the lake level to rise more quickly. Next. Why are we, are ex ex we are experiencing changes in our climate. I, I go with climate variability because the climate has always changed, but we are seeing much greater variability these days than we did uh, you know, in the early 1900s. While this is true, the, basically the plumbing, the uh, system of stream and lake hydraulics remains the same due to topography, hydrology, as geology, as well as what we do to regulate these waters, be the water levels of a lake, be these water levels of now the New York State Barge Canal. So we, there's only so much that can be done. Next. And Skinny Atlas Lake is part of the larger Oswego River Basin. Therefore, Skinny Atlas Lake and all the Finger Lakes and the contributing streams must share the brunt of this climate change variability and the associated changes in water level regulation, both high and low level conditions. Again, it's not that simple. It's difficult to do, but you gotta think about it and you gotta think about what can I do to make things better for me and for my neighbors. Next. Again, prior to uh, the uh, the use of the lake for water supply. There were a number of industries that had dams along Skinny Alice Creek and used that water supply to water to basically run their mills and then allow that water to go down, initially flow in and allow the Erie, Erie Canal to function from Jordan at the summit level to the east and west, and then later on for the water supply to the city of Syracuse, as well as Skinny Alice, Elbridge, and Jordan. And with that, next, the ups and downs of Skinny Atlas Lake, or how I learned to stop worrying and accept the changes and plan accordingly how to deal with those changes. Next, questions. All yours, Camille. Great, thank you so much, Bill. I'm gonna stop sharing for a second. I can see we already have a couple questions in the Q&A, so let me pull that up. Um, let me scroll up to the top. Um, someone is asking, what about August 2021? This was when we had bad flooding on Skinny Atlas, not October, November. Do you know anything about that, Bill, if there was anything that well, you heard I about the lakes having issues? 
um, di directly, no. I mean, we'd have to look at the hydrograph for that year to see what was going on at Skinny Ice Lake, and I don't believe it was on that graphic. Um, as I recall, and as I showed on there, the flooding on all the Finger Lakes was end of October, beginning of November. If there was flooding earlier, there's a good possibility there could have been flooding earlier. So that could have been compounded by the heavier rainfall toward the end of the month. In most cases, uh, again, looking at the rural curves, the highest water level is during the summer with the low water levels being, you know, this time of the year and then water levels rising and then falling in the fall. In most cases, the rural curves are difficult to try to keep the water level high enough to keep everybody happy on the lake. But in most cases, due to drier conditions, the, the water level is lower. But apparently in October of that year, there was a lot of flooding going on, a lot more water, and so the water level was higher. So again, uh, these year-to-year -year changes are dependent upon how precipitation falls and how heavily, how quickly it falls and how quickly the lake level will change. Great. Um, another question is over the last several years, the town of Niles at the southwest side of Skinny Atlas have been doing some ditch work that's causing water runoff to get to the lake faster, causing some erosion and sediment to enter the lake. What could be done about townships negatively affecting water quality? It's my understanding that most of the county soil and water conservation districts try to work with the municipalities in as far as one, you know, ditching of roadways, but number two, and more importantly, is as quickly as possible, try to mulch and seed those ditches so that any water running down those ditches is sort of sitting on a blanket of uh, either the mulch and or vegetation growing in those ditches to try to reduce the erosion. If those ditches are being dug and not being revegetated, that is something of a concern as, as noted because you get this water ripping down through these unlined ditches, which erode and then carry the sediment downstream and then eventually down to the lake. So if I think people see that, they need to talk to their municipal officials and then, you know, say, okay, if you need to deepen these things, don't over deepen them. And secondly, try to get a vegetative cover in those ditches as quickly as possible to keep the amount of erosion down. But like, you know, like I said, this is seemingly something that is always going on. We want to get that water off those, those properties, be they at the top of the, the watershed or near the bottom of the watershed. We want to get that water off our property as quickly as possible. And this causes increased flooding along rivers and increased flooding in lakes. Great, um, someone's asking, how is a lake discharge actually regulated? What is the physical mechanism? There are a series of gates that are basically uh, at uh, like the Route 20 uh, bridge crossing. And that's, they raise and lower those gates uh, to basically control the water level. You'd have to talk to the city about how they go about doing that. Great, another question. Um, this is one I can sort of answer. As the city of Syracuse monitors the water level and posts the level on their website, it hasn't been updated since January 9th. Um, usually they update it every Monday. Do you know why they're not doing so? Is there another site that posts the lake levels? Um, I'm not sure why it hasn't been updated. I know they don't frequently collect or post the data as much in the winter. Um, I can check in with um, folks from the city of Syracuse and see um, if they have more updates. I know the city of Syracuse has been updating their website, so I'm not sure if things are just not getting updated on that end. So I can check in about that and see, but um, I try to keep it as updated as possible on the Skinny Atlas Lake watershed. Um, so there's, as far as I know, there's not other, another site that has the updated lake levels. Um, let's see. Um, this person is asking, wasn't the level of the lake artificially raised by several feet a hundred years or so ago when the dam was built? That is a good question. There may have been a dam built 
like where Route 20 is? That is a question basically uh, either for the Historical Association or the city of Syracuse. I am not really sure uh, about whether the lake level was raised. If it was raised, was it for uh, trying to increase the volume of water for the water supply for this for the city and Skinny Atlas, Jordan Elbridge? That is a question that I really don't know the answer to. Uh, this has been brought up in a couple of the other Finger Lakes where 100 years ago, plus minus. Uh, uh, I can say that because I live on Cuyahoga Lake and near Cuyahoga Lake, I did explore that in greater detail. And when they put in the lock in the 1920s, it did not raise the water level for Cuyahoga Lake. But for Skinny Atlas Lake, that is a good question. And that is a question, again, for either the city of Syracuse or the Historical Association. Great. Um, Rich is asking about some solutions. So do retention ponds and tanks on our lakeside properties make a meaningful impact? Um, they do to a certain degree. They do a good job of, uh, especially if it's coming down a hill, of capturing sediment and preventing that sediment from getting into the, uh, the, the lake proper. In as far as the volume of water, most of those retention ponds are fairly small. And if you get a sizable storm, if that pond was dry, it probably would fill very readily. And then from that point, it would overflow and then flow into the lake. So there is a uh, sediment retention capability that is good. As far as water volume, it is limited by the size of the retention pond. Great. Um, do you know if the shoreline of the village of Skinny Atlas was a swampy area? Uh, Looking at some of the old photos, if you remember that one for Glenhaven, you'll remember that you saw the edge of the lake was basically all coarse gravel. And that was material that had been washed by the changes in water level. It would be my guess that for the most part, there was a natural uh, cobble and coarse gravel uh, around the lake. There may have been wetlands adjacent to the lake that had been modified over time, but it would be my guess, and again, a guess, that most of the shoreline of the lake, except at the extreme southern end of the lake, probably had limited wetlands along the shoreline, except maybe where a large stream flowed in, it created what is called an alluvial fan, and you might have had some small wetlands along the sides of the alluvial fans. Uh, this person's asking, do you think the rural curves will be changed? And if so, when might that occur? Have any other lakes changed their rural curves at all? Uh, there has been talk of changing the rural curves based upon our changing climate. None have been done so far. Uh, there is a consideration of that being done, looking at the greater variability of our, our climate. But again, changing those rule curves only uh, can, can only be done so much. There is not a happy medium. There is not a happy medium by saying, well, let's turn in our lakes into flood control structures. So let's keep the water levels low. You can't do that because people have their docks, people have their water supplies in those lakes uh, and people, you know, the water from the lake is used for the water supply for Syracuse and the villages uh, around the lake and further downstream. And there, there are those that say, no, we need the water level higher, but that, you know, limits the amount of water that uh, can be stored in the lake. So with these larger and larger storm, we're gonna see more incidents where we're gonna see the lake level rising even higher. So, you know, basically there may be some tweaks to them, but in general, I think the rule curves suffice. Maybe there can be some tweaks, but even with those tweaks, there's gonna be periods of drought where the water levels are gonna be below 
the rule curve and there's not much we can do about that. And there's gonna be times when we're gonna get these massive amounts of rainfall coming in, the lake levels are gonna go up and uh, releasing water downstream is limited by the capacity of the, in this case, Skinny Alice Creek. In the case of other lakes is limited by, again, the stream downstream and also that good neighbor policy. Let's not just because, you know, Skinny Alice Lake is 90 feet higher than the Seneca River say, let her rip, we don't care. You can't be that way. You've got to think about those that live downstream. Um, Freddie is asking about, could a long-term plan looking at water banking through wet shores of Skinny Atlas Lake, Skinny Atlas Creek, and Seneca River help improve ability to bank water? Uh, water banking is basically looking at a uh, either surface or groundwater uh, place to bank that water. Uh, the surrounding uh, soils and the fact that there's a lot of development, especially along the northern part of the lake, limits the amount of banking that can occur. Uh, the banking of water higher up in the watershed, there's a lot of agricultural areas up there. And uh, I don't think there's uh, either the soils to take it or the farmers, you know, want to, to farm their properties. If you look downstream along Skinny Atlas Creek, Skinny Atlas Creek is a very interesting creek bed. During low level, low water discharges, believe it or not, the city has actually gone into the bed of Skinny Atlas Creek because Skinny Atlas Creek is a losing stream. Water infiltrates into the fractures in the creek bed and adjacent to the creek bed. This water reappears at Skinny Atlas Falls. So there is some natural water banking going on there. But when a basic low flow amount is determined, the city has gone in at times and has found places where water is disappearing into the bedrock and has grouted them shut so that they can maintain the flow, excuse me, they maintain the flow in Skinny Atlas Creek and not have to over discharge water from the lake to maintain that discharge that is required downstream in the creek. Great. Um, I think some of these questions we've already talked about. Um, can I share your presentation, Bill? Yes. Your, your slides? Okay, great. Um, let's see. This is from Fran. The storm in the late summer of 2021 came after a week of the water slowly rising. It could be seen happening in about 10 days time. The increase in the lake level was at least eight inches. Then the storm came. After all the shoreline and property damage, um, then the city of Syracuse finally increased the water going out to 160 million gallons a day for multiple days. Um, she's asking, it would seem a watchful eye could have seen what was going on and increased the outflow a bit over the days instead of the massive outflow they did after the storm. Do you want to comment on that and some of the connections to? Oh, yeah. This is a, tip <laughs> this is a typical response that people say, open it up, let it rip. There are, again, besides the good neighbor policy, um, if you look at weather forecasts, weather forecasts have a skill level and the skill level is about two to three days. If you listen to a weather forecast and you listen to the meteorologists on TV or look at the weather forecasts uh, from the National Weather Service online, you'll see that the weather forecasts are pretty good two to three days out. But after that, not so good and they become rather vague. In fact, I listened to the forecast uh, tonight for this upcoming weekend and all the weather people were basically saying, well, we've got this storm coming in Friday, Friday night into Saturday and we really can't give you the amount of snow. It's looking pretty good for Syracuse, but down in the Southern tier, 
you know, they may be getting a lot of snow and things like that. So basically to answer your question, the skill level of weather forecasting is only good out to about three days. So a three-day forecast, if they say, it looks like we're gonna get a lot of rain three days out, yes, the different water control authorities can open up, but again, they can only lower the water level a couple of tenths of a foot per day. But if you get uh, a large storm, coming in, dumping multiple inches of rain, that water level in that lake, be it Cayuga, be it Skinny Atlas or any of the other ones is gonna go up and it's gonna go up very quickly in a day or so. So you're still gonna get that flooding. It is very difficult to move out. Uh, basically, it is difficult because you're sort of damned if you do and damned if you don't. If you do it and the rain doesn't come, then you're going to get people complaining the water level is too low. If you lower it down and then all of a sudden you get all this rain, you're going to get yelled at because you didn't lower it in enough. Again, we only have a skill level of about three days for weather forecasts, and that only allows a limited amount of water to flow out of the lake, where again, if you get multiple inches of rain coming in, it flows within a day or two readily into the lake and raises the water level by feet. So I think Fran meant, was it, would it be possible for the city of Syracuse to have slowly released the lake levels if they thought there was going to be a storm instead of kind of opening it up? Or is it just too unpredictable with the way weather, weather forecasts kind of go? Right, it's, it's just what I said. If the city felt that there was a forecast for a considerable amount of rain, they could probably make a decision. And you have to talk to the city because they're the ones that control the water level to may maybe increase the discharge if they felt it was a considerable amount of rain. If it was gonna be thunderstorms that maybe occur in just one part of the watershed, they probably wouldn't. It would have to be like the remnant of a hurricane. It would have to be uh, a major front where it's forecast to hit the entire central New York area with a considerable amount of rain. Otherwise, again, it all depends upon what they've done in the past. These people you know, are watching the forecasts and they are trying to regulate within the roll curves but there is a limited amount that they can do. So, you know, it's, it's uh, again, a discussion that uh, can be held with the city to see what they could do. You know, could they do it smarter? But the whole thing is, it's always difficult because the weather forecast, even within that two to three day period can go wrong. And, you know, did they release too much? People are gonna complain it's too low or, they didn't release them up and then at the water level is, is gonna go even higher. Um, it's very difficult. Again, it's okay, what can you do to try to protect either your shoreline or protect your, your home along a creek that drains to the lake? It's a, a combined effort. It's an individual effort and it's a community effort. And in this case, with the city controlling the lake level, for water supply, among other things, it's it's a combined effort of all those different levels. Great, thank you, Bill. Um, it's 8.04, so I just wanna do some wrap up. Um, I put the um, evaluation link in the chat, please um, fill that out. I will go through and look at all of your feedback and take them that into consideration. Um, I also, put the save the date for our next program, as well as our newsletter sign up. I'm guessing most of you are already signed up for our newsletter, but just um, sharing some of those links. Um, I don't wanna keep Bill for too much longer since it's 8.04. So um, maybe I can just share your contact information, Bill. And if people have questions or questions that we didn't get to, um, you, would you be okay with that? That would be fine. I can try to answer the question. I, I don't have all the answers. If I did, I'd be in Las Vegas right now. 
<laughs> Great. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us tonight. And a huge thank you to Bill for giving a fabulous presentation. I know I really enjoyed, especially the historical photos um, that I had never seen before of Skinny Atlas Lake and learning more about some of the broader connections between Skinny Atlas to the other Finger Lakes and, and the Seneca River. So um, thank you very much. I will try to go through some of these questions and I can maybe share some of those that we didn't get to with you as well, Bill. Um, but otherwise, um, we're going to wrap this up. And thank you all, everyone, again, for joining us. And I hope you have a great night. And thank you, Camille, for moving things forward. <laughs>